Welcome to the Real Trending Podcast, where we speak to the brightest minds in real estate about leadership, business growth, trends, and strategy. I'm your host, Tracy Velt, the Senior Director of Data and Content for HW Media, which includes Housing Wire and Real Trends. Today, I'd like to welcome Dina golden -Tayer. She is the Executive Director of Sales at Douglas Elliman in Miami Beach, Florida. She's also ranked number 21 um, individual sales associates by volume in the 2023 Real Trends and Tom Ferry, um, the thousand real estate professionals. And she is the number one agent for Douglas Elements. So welcome, Dina. Thank you so much for having me, Tracy. It's an honor to be here. Yeah. So I just want to start and um, just give you a little, have, have you give our audience just a little background about you, how you got started in, in sales, and if you um, have any type of niche that you work, um, what that is. Sure. Um, I've been in real estate for 18 years. Um, I definitely started at the bottom, you know, doing rentals and everything else that, you know, comes with that territory. Um, I specialize in Miami Beach Marketplace and I brand myself as an ultra luxury realtor specializing in double digit properties. Okay, great. Obviously, this market has frustrated a lot of real estate professionals. We're seeing a lot of them um, start to leave the business. Um, so what are some things that you think agents should be doing but aren't um, to really drive their business forward in this type of a market? Um, they should be marketing and they should be spending as much money on marketing as when they were making the most. And tell me a little bit about that. Give me more detail. What are you doing um, as far as marketing that's really driving your business? Everything. Um, that's how I stand out in my marketplace. You know, when I sit down on listing presentations with owners, I specifically let them know um, you control the price, you control the condition of your property, I control the marketing. Um, so there's no uh, expense um, that I don't undertake uh, just because the market may not be as strong as it was during our COVID peak. And, and so I need more specifics than that. So remember, people are like the agents are sure. listening to this and they sure. they're so looking don't for skimp ways on a to video. improve their business. Right. Okay. So don't skimp on a video, right? Like um, that videos are probably the most expensive marketing expense that we take on. Um, and I have a segment called Step Inside With Me, which um, I started about five years ago. It's a branded segment where I do um, tours of my listings. And those are probably my largest uh, marketing expense per year. And I uh, continue those wholeheartedly and have added actually more media to my business by doing specific video walkthroughs on iPhone that I can launch on my social media because the glossy high tech videos might take two weeks to produce. So uh, it's not a time to scale back is my advice, even if you're making less money. Okay. And so are you reaching a lot of, I know obviously South Florida has a lot of international buyers. Um, do you work with a lot of international buyers or are they mostly from kind of feeder markets in the U.S.? I would say North American. Uh, the biggest international uh, buyer that I have for Miami are Canadians. Um, they sometimes get grouped into the American category, which they clearly are not. Um, so North Americans are the biggest buyers of Miami top tier assets. Uh, the international buyer for me is not a large source of buyer. Okay. And so when you're trying to reach those, uh, obviously video plays a huge role in reaching um, Canadian buyers. Are they moving? Are there any moving here? Are they mostly vacation homes? And what are you doing specifically with your marketing um, to reach that uh, those those buyers? Well, the Canadian buyers specifically that I work with, they may already be here and they're upgrading. Um, okay. I'm not really working with the snowbirds that want a condo uh, to use a few weeks a year. Um, I'm, I'm working with the ones that have tried that out and have fully redomiciled here or in the process of doing so. You know, the local buyer very much is, is so important uh, in my marketplace, but where they come from could still very much be a feeder market, you know, but if you've already lived here for three or four years, then you sort of become this hybrid of from California, but now upgrading to a bigger house. Um, and as far as uh, what I'm doing to target that market is, you know, they're following me on my Instagram. That is my, my biggest um, tool in my toolbox for attracting buyers, you know, direct buyers for my own listings. Um, 
they watch for my, you know, debut of one of my Step Inside With Me videos. And oftentimes they contact me directly. Okay. What else are you doing on your Instagram to drive engagement? Um, is it all real estate or are you doing some personal? Um, have you seen you know? my Instagram? <laughs> no, I haven't. So I'll have to look at it. Your PR person didn't tell me that you were big in Instagram. So I am. Um, I, my, I mean, again, what does big mean? You know, for me, I have a hundred thousand followers, but when I look at uh, quality, right, the, the beauty of Instagram is I can go through my stories and see who's following me, you know, um, you know, president of this company, chairman of this billionaire, right? Like it's, it's such an interactive tool. So it lets me know whose eyes are on my product, um, which is why I rely so heavily on it. No, to answer your earlier question, I would say, but it's about 90% uh, business and 10%, you know, my kids, my husband, a little bit of travel. Okay. And I mean, obviously being authentic is super important on social media and by posting, you know, your kids and, and your family and that it's, it's really important. What advice do you have for agents who are just getting started and really don't know how to start their Instagram or TikTok or whatever social media they choose? I mean, there's so many companies that specialize in that, right? Like when I started five years ago, I didn't have much guidance. It was just kind of my own creative outlet that I hoped would lead to sales. Um, I had just gone through a breakup with a business partner of 12 years. So I was able to use the, uh, Instagram as a way to rebrand me as, as the brand. Um, now there's literally media companies that specialize in agent content. So I think, you know, that just becomes such a roadmap. You know, you don't have to... Um, figure it out on your own. And sometimes I'll watch what someone else is doing and be like, oh, I like that. Let me do that next week, you know? And speaking of authenticity, I just started a new segment, a day in the life segment that we post once a week. That's just, you know, not high edited, glossy, full on hair and makeup production, right? Just like run around town with me and see what I'm doing that day. Yeah, I've seen I've seen several um, agents do that kind of on TikTok where they, it's like, here's a day in the life of a, of a realtor. Um, and some of them are done really well. And some of them, you know, you could tell they're just kind of starting out. So, so it's interesting. But that's the beauty of, of social media. You can just be starting out and not even have listings, but you, you can curate your content to be the image you want to present. You know, I'm blessed that I have the listings, So I have a place where I can film and I, I constantly have just listed, just sold, price reduced, right? I constantly have content. Yeah. In the luxury market, it's especially um, important to, well, it's really important in real estate in general to build relationships, but luxury market, I feel like takes it to another level. And not only that, um, it's the discretion and it's the professionalism that's so important. Um, what what are some lessons that you've learned in the, in the luxury market um, that have really kind of helped you move forward um, and be as successful as you are? I mean, people are pretty much concerned about their bottom line, right? Um, in addition to the items you mentioned, you know, being able to operate at those levels, discretion, obviously those are great factors to point out. Those, those are important. Um, but people want to know you're going to make them the most, you know? So I've established a reputation as, uh, when it's my listing that I'm going to break a price per foot record, right? That I'm, um, not going to be gun shy about, uh, putting out a product that has yet to be supported by comps. Uh, but there's also a fine balance in knowing when to say no to listings, especially in the current uh, marketplace, which is not as strong as it was, you know, two years ago. It's important to sometimes know, like, I'm not going to take this listing. I'd rather be the second agent. Um, and that obviously I'm now, you know, a 19 year veteran. I can now feel the pulse of a property like Two years ago, I would take any listing, you know, it, it didn't need to have a pulse. It was getting, get multiple offers now, because I do commit so much marketing money and time, um, and can only have so much bandwidth. Right. Um, I am choosy about my listings. I don't represent everything. I, I actually sometimes have to say no to business. Okay. And what would be some reasons that you would say no, um, you know, unrealistic price expectations or. Unrealistic price expectations or improper presentation. You know, if someone's home has not been prepped for the market and they don't want to commit the uh, the money to do so, um, I'm not able to take on those listings. And how? What's the dialogue that you have with that? Like, how do you how do you approach something like that? I think a lot of agents feel very 
um, a scared to say no to taking a listing, um, even success, very successful agents, especially in this market. Um, but B don't want to obviously offend the seller either. Um, how do you, how do you walk that line? It's a fine one. Um, but I am all about the direct approach. Um, it's, it's not about, you know, it's so common to go in someone's home and walk through it when they're giving you a tour and say, Ooh, ah, you know, wow. You know, and that is a nice moment, right? People want to hear that, but then you get back to the dining room table and you talk reality, you know, and if you're not comfortable doing that, then, um, then that's going to lead, uh, you know, an agent to taking listings that, um, they have a very small shot of selling. And I take the direct approach, right? I, I tell the clients, um, I need X amount of money for staging, or can we, you know, set up this room as a bedroom instead of your, you know, yoga room? Um, because once we're working together, we're a team, right? Me and the owner are a team and team is how do we sell your house for the most amount of money in the shortest amount of time? And if someone can't take my suggestions, we're not going to be a good team. Right. Because if you're hiring me, it's because you think I bring something to the table that's going to lead to your goal of high sale, shortest amount of time. And if someone takes things too personally, they're probably not going to pick me as a listing agent because I am very direct. Yeah, I mean, that's true, too. I think that there's a in your especially in the luxury market and the market you're working in, I think that um, most of those sellers do appreciate more of a direct approach anyway. Um, they're busy people. They, yeah, let's get it done. Well, they may not time. choose me the first time. Then they didn't get an offer. When I they come in the second time, I say, oh, this room should have been set up like this, or we should have painted these walls white. And then they're all, you know, gung ho for it. So the takeaway is sometimes you have to say no in this market and then catch it as the second agent. Yeah. And what, um, I mean, obviously you've built up a business where you're getting a lot of referral business. Um, but what about, uh, what, what got you to that point? So what, what tips do you have for agents who are, are in the, just beginning to try to build that referral um, network and prove themselves? And, um, you know, even the agents who are struggling now, who maybe entered the business when everything was basically given to them. That you're going to get multiple offers. You know, everybody wants to move here, especially Florida. Um, tell me a little bit about that. You know, that was a unicorn market, and anyone who thinks that that is everyday uh, real estate, you know, needs to take the rose-colored glasses off. It was a tough adjustment for everybody, right? Yeah, definitely. But like, what are some things that they, um, you know, other than marketing? What are some lessons that you've learned um, as far as, you know, building that referral market? How are you how are you keeping in touch with people? What are you doing um, to kind of help them remember you to use you next time? It's it's not that innovative, right? When I sell something, I send a, a, a mailer, a direct mailer to the neighborhood so that all the neighbors um know that I sold it. I hang a sign, right? Like that says just sold or pending. There are there is a fine balance in my business uh in doing the the basics, you know, the real estate 101 that's mixed in with this extra layer of high production media. Um, you know, I, I make sure if I if I can to wish someone a happy birthday or a happy holiday just as a way to reach out. I always give them a closing gift. You know, people remember the agent that didn't give them a closing gift. You know, it doesn't have to be something expensive, but it sh there should be some sort of acknowledgement of, hey, thank you for your business. Um, I I have a touch system to check in with them because my market is very transient. People tend to sell between one to five years of ownership. Um, so I, I always uh, look for ways to touch them, um, even if it's just by an email campaign. You know, but again, my Instagram, you know, getting people to follow me means I don't really have to do any of those extra touches because every morning when they wake up and scroll in bed, they see my post. They see what I'm selling. Yeah. Well, I'm definitely going to follow you on Instagram from now on. Thank you, Tracy. And, um, <laughs> and also, I do want to know, um, as far as networking, um, oh, I lost you at your camera. Oh, there you are. Okay. Um, I do want to know as far as networking, uh, because, you know, I think the key in, in kind of maybe like a, a market like Miami Beach is to really be out there and meeting the movers and shakers who can then become clients um, or refer clients to you. What are you um, what are you doing uh, from that perspective? 
So, you know, I'm, I'm a mom now. I have two very small kids, uh, a one-year-old and a three-year-old. So my networking capabilities are really, you know, limited uh, because I want to get home. I want to put my kids to sleep, you know, after I've been out of the house all day. Um, so for me, I'm very choosy about what events, you know, are after work hours. Um, it's, it's not my strength. I know many, many brokers have built their business on, you know, going to get a beer with their client. That, that's just not me. Um, I'm finding, I'm finding more, you know, I totally believe in the need for outreach, but I'm, I've moved my business to the direction of panelists, you know, or attending a special event where you can mingle with, with your colleagues. Um, naturally from clients in town and they say, Hey, let's go to dinner. Of course they make that happen, but it's just not the core of how I built my business. Yeah. Okay. That's interesting. Um, you're right. There are definitely several different ways to build a business. And, and that is, is one way. Um, I kind of prefer your way, to be honest with you. I think that would be more my style as well. So um, well, like tonight I have a dinner with the other um, parents at my son's school. Right. So um, I mean, and that is twofold. I want to meet the parents of, you know, of the kids of my son's grade, but it's certainly naturally real estate will come up as it does at every dinner table in Miami, because that's all people talk about. Um, but I'm not going to that dinner with that expectation. I'm not going with that expectation of, let me talk to the moms who have big house, right? I'm going to meet the moms who I can set up play dates uh, with for my son. And again, I think that authenticity goes a long way because people can smell you coming, you know? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And what have you, I want to switch gears and talk a little bit about the Florida market because it was, you know, just so hot and it continues to do better than, than many markets around the state. So what True. changes are you seeing now though in the, in the Florida market or in your really specifically local to you? I am. I, I actually brand myself as hyper local. Um, which, you know, so many brokers right now, some of the top brokers, they're all about expansion, right? I'm in Austin, you know, I'm in Philadelphia, I'm in LA, I'm in Boston, and I'm like, I'm in Miami Beach up to Golden Beach, you know, with a little bit of sprinkling of Coral Gables, like 80% of my business is Miami Beach. So um, that for me, that is, you know, my power, you know, that I don't miss a beat in my marketplace. So how different, how, how has it changed um, in the past year? What are you seeing? Are there different um, areas where buyers are coming from or, uh, you know, obviously it's No, I mean, all of that, all of that has stayed the same. It's just okay. buyers don't feel the need to pull the trigger as quickly because there is inventory, right? It's not a tremendous amount of inventory, but if you fly in for a weekend, we can look at 10 to 15 homes, whereas yeah. in, you know, maybe a year and a half ago, we would look at five, you know? Um, so it's not like, you know, an overwhelming amount of inventory. And when there's a good house, there's, there's more product, but there's very limited good product. Yeah. Um, so, uh, but buyers will leave to right. Miami's like, I'm here for vacation. Let's look at a few things that happens. If they'll leave and come back four months later and see the same homes on the market, they might say, mm, okay, you know, let me keep waiting. But if they see that mostly the good stuff they looked at the prior three, four months is gone and sold at good numbers, then they start thinking, hmm okay, you know, there's not going to be some crazy shift here. You know, I'm not going to be waiting for the rates um, to drop. Um, I'm just going to do what makes sense for, for me and my, my needs, you know? So there's a greater patience required. You know, there's higher days on market. Um, we're obviously in a better, sh in better shape in Miami Beach than most anywhere else in the country, but we're still dealing with the same themes. How are you getting buyers or um, sellers kind of off the fence? How are you getting them to list? Because obviously a lot of them have either bought most, you know, either what spent cash. So it doesn't really matter what their interest rate is, but the ones right. who did finance have lower interest rates if they bought, you know, previous to the, the current market. Sure. Um, how are you getting, yeah. How are you getting them off the, off the fence? How are you convincing them to, to list um, if there's no need to move? It's not my goal. People, when they usually call, call me are ready to sell. And I'm one of, you know, two or three or five agents that they're interviewing. And if they are not ready to sell, then I offer to rent it for them because being someone's rental agent gets your foot in the door. So when they're ready to sell, right, they use you. Um, I have a, a ton of rental business. You know, I really do a lot of rentals. That is definitely a way for me to stay relevant, even though we all know rentals are a lot of work for way less money. Yeah. I mean, a lot of agents won't touch them. So um, what, you know, obviously it's really worked for you doing rentals. So what are your secrets with that? Um, just, 
you know, the hard work that goes into it or yeah. Yeah. I mean, listen, I did 7 million in gross rental income last year. It's a lot of rentals. Um, I take them as seriously as sales. In fact, sometimes even more diligently with the paperwork because, you know, the lease paperwork is this thick and the for sale paperwork is like this. So you have to be really dedicated to the minutia and administrative, you know, burden of doing a lease. Um, so we have a system, right? We have a checklist. This is what we do for our leases. And, um, yeah, I try to just keep a positive attitude about them because there are days where I just want to work on deals and then, oh, I've got to give an hour of my attention to this lease. Um, but you got to do it or, or, or don't, but if you got to do it, you should do it well. Yeah. I would think in your market that, um, a lot of the people coming to rent are eventually going to buy anyway. Um, they're just not sure where they want to buy at this point. So, um, what percentage do you generally convert to, to, um, buyers? That's such a great question, Tracy. I haven't done that stat in a while. Uh, a few years ago, um, I, I did run the math. It was about 10%. 10% of renters turn buyers. Wait, no, that's wrong. Sorry. 10% of my renters bought the property that they were renting. So that's, so we are very serious about putting in that language into all our leases that if they buy, we're procuring costs and the landlord must pay us a commission. That's yeah, that's super smart for sure. And that's interesting. So they rent um, and eventually end up buying that house. Huh? Okay. Or condo. Or condo. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it is a starter run, right? So I want to talk about some trends, and um, one of them is kind of chat GPT. It's like the hottest thing right now. And um, are you or your team using it at all, or do you have any plans to use it? Are you exploring it at all? What are your thoughts? I mean, I take my marketing descriptions, like, you know, what show up on Zillow and MLS very seriously. Uh, We have like a multiple person policy, you know, one person who is uh, maybe most familiar with the property and has visited the most rights of description. And there's a second person that checks it. And then I'm the third and I come in and I give it my touch. Um, so no, we have not embraced uh, chat GPT for things like that because I, you know, I, I take my marketing very seriously. I want my photos perfect. I want my description perfect. Could I see, you know, uh, how other agents who maybe aren't so into expressive, persuasive writing uh, use it? Sure. Good for them. I mean, why not? Yeah, yeah. I mean, there are other uses too. I haven't completely explored all of the different uses. I feel like it's right now kind of like the app store was. I mean, I guess it still is, although apps aren't as big as they used to be, where there are a million different apps and you're trying to narrow it down to the ones that work the best. Um, You know, I searched through some real estate ones. There's a a lot of really amazing things that they say they could do. Um, Sure operationally, you know, marketing plans, budget wise, things like that. So it's, it's interesting. I want to talk no, about, I, think your- I, I haven't gotten into chat GPT maybe as much as others. Well, maybe you're busy selling. So <laughs> I mean, there's, I, I read a stat once or I heard it at an event that, you know, um, only 8% of car purchases are done online, that 92% of people still want to, you know, go to the dealership and buy their car. And that made me feel really great about, you know, if people take their car purchase so seriously and want the human touch, then they take their real estate purchase like exponentially more seriously because that's the roof over their head, you know? So it really made me feel great that our profession as uh, real estate uh, agents will continue to thrive um, and that we're not going to be replaced by uh, a bot on Zillow. I want to talk about your aha moment um, because you've been in the business for a while now, and I'm sure that there have been ups and downs through different markets, obviously. So, um, you know, I find that every leader really has one of those moments where they're like, oh, you know what, whatever I'm doing right now isn't working. Or you found some inspiration that that you ended up doing something different and it really worked for you. What was what was your biggest aha moment? My aha moment was that. Um, I don't want to be part of a team. Um, you know, again, I had a partner for 12 years um, and we we did great. You know, ever, we were well, well respected and our numbers were strong and we just kind of were like comfortably coasting, you know, and uh, only when I got, because most people, part, you know, rave about their partnership. I end up talking about the dissolution of my partnership uh, because that kind of forced me to become a new agent again 
to hustle like I was hustling in my 20s, you know, to really like take every lead seriously because so much was on the line. And that really resurgence um, is what helped me enter the luxury marketplace to the level that you know, it grew into today. Yeah, that's interesting because, you know, all I hear is the team, team, everybody, you know, needs to be on a team, um, you know. And, and I don't really, think there's anything wrong with that. It's yeah. just, I wasn't just on a team. I was, I was a 50, 50 partner. Yeah. Right. And it's, it's just like a marriage. And, um, for me to go the other direction of just solely relying on myself and seeing the fruits of my labor, um, was what gave me a, an amazing kickstart, you know, about six years ago. Yeah. And I assume you have administrative help though. Just I not. have so much support. You know, yeah. I have so, I have a ton of support <laughs> and yeah. I am blessed to have such wonderful um, administrative marketing and showing, um, you know, assistance, right? Like, I have a lot of support, but I make, you know, but the majority of the decisions are made by me. Whereas when you're in a 50, 50 partnership, yeah, you get to control what's going on, um, and it's great to have that support. But you're the one out there, uh, you know, doing the rainmaking and and doing the business and paying for paying for all the expenses, yeah. right? Because one nice reason to have a partner is you share the expenses too, not just the profits. Yeah. Um, but for me, that was my aha moment. Okay. Um, and where do you find inspiration or motivation? Do you have any coaches that you follow, speakers, um, podcasts, you know, books, anything that you're you're listening to, reading, um, or people in your life who really inspire and motivate you? I, I wish I had something great to point out to. Um, I'm, I'm really just driven by um, results. You know, I what I do is I walk around my neighborhood and I push the stroller and I I say to my little baby like mommy's going to sell that house, you know, and I really like do that intention, you know, and, and I, I put it in my sight line. And again, like some of the, um, I think I heard Josh Altman uh, say this and, and um, one of his um, talks, uh, you know, take the different home home, right? Like drive a different street. Cause someone that you might've just forgotten about is like right in front of your eyes. And when I do that, I really like, I stop the car, I jot down everything saying like, call this person tomorrow. Cause I see that as like a sign from the universe that, Hey, I drove down this street today to remember about Bob who I haven't touched in a year, you know? Um, so I'm really more about that, like kind of intentional, uh, moments. Um, and again, being so hyper local, uh, allows me to have that connectivity. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, my final question is just what advice do you have for uh, new or really real estate agents who are struggling right now? Um, you know, other you, you had talked about marketing and that, but like just on a on a basic level, what advice do you have for them? I mean, it's such a broad question, but just to draw on the subjects that we talk about to add some, you know, of a conclusion, you know, do rentals, right? Like, uh, why not? Maybe that person is, is the niece or nephew of someone who's going to go buy a really big house, you know, um, spend more time on your social media, right? Cause it can, it can cost you time, but it doesn't have to cost you money. You know, um, say no to business. That's going to drain your energy and you're never going to make a fee. You know, that's great. Um, well, Dina, thank you so much for joining the Real Trending Podcast. We really appreciate you being on and congratulations on all of your success. Of course. Thank you for having me. This really was an incredible interview. You did a great job. 